Oh, yeah. Ooh, 1050. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3 this week. We're in Galatians chapter 3. We're also going to be in Acts a little bit, and we're also going to be in John a little bit. So Galatians chapter 3 is our uh, main text. We're also going to look in Galatians 5. And you know what, we might even pick out other verses as well. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 5. Also keep your finger in John and Acts. If you can do all that, that's pretty good. But we're in the middle of a series called Becoming the People That God Wants Us to Be. Becoming the people that God wants us to be. God doesn't want you to be the same today as you were last year or the, you were five years ago. He definitely don't, doesn't want you to be the same Christian today uh, that you were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago when you gave your life to Christ. He is growing us. He is growing us until we meet him in glory. And so we want to become the people that God wants us to be. And the other thing too, especially in our culture today, um, there's so much about identity and there's so many topics about um, you know, self-preservation and making sure that it's all about individualism and things like that. We've got to be really careful as Christians that we stay focused on who God calls us to be and who the Lord wants us to be, not what other people want us to be, not what the government wants us to be or our schools want us to be or our politicians or anybody else. Who is it that God wants us to be? And that's what we're focused on in this series. The series is going longer than what I originally thought. Um, we might even go another three more weeks after this, but I hear a lot of good reports that God is touching a lot of people. So we're in Galatians chapter 3 today, and you'll see butterflies and you'll see caterpillars around. And we've been having some uh, caterpillars that have turned into cocoons that have now turned into actual butterflies. And just like a caterpillar uh, changing and transforming into a butterfly, God wants you to change and transform into the person that he is calling you to be. And so our butterflies have hatched and we're going to release them uh, right after service today. There's, there's quite a few of them. It looks like there's eggs too at the very bottom. So they're reproducing and obviously uh, they're being transformed and we're going to release them today. The first week we looked at Nicodemus. We looked at what it really means to be a Christ follower. We kind of dissected the fan versus the follower aspect. Some people are fans of Jesus. Some people are followers of Jesus. And it was the goal that week to decide and determine, are you a fan of Jesus to where you know about him? Or are you a follower that you know him personally as your Lord and Savior? And I would highly recommend that if you do not know the Lord as your personal Savior, you do not leave this building. Amen? Don't leave this building until you know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. Then the second week, we looked at what it meant to be people of mercy. And uh, I had five stones up here, and we looked at the five things that prevent us from being people of mercy toward other people, things like anger and bitterness, revenge is a big one, hurt and pride. Those are five things that prevent us from being people of mercy. Last week, we looked at the history lesson of the Bible and how the Bible came into being. I highly recommend if you didn't get that uh, lesson or if you didn't get that teaching, to, there's a CD or put an order and we can get you a CD of that or you can go online. If you don't know how the Bible came, in, came in about, how do we get 66 books? Why are there 27 and why are there 39 in the Old Testament? And how was, the, uh, how was it selected and who selected it and who chose all that? All of that was last week's message. So you might want to check that out um, if you don't know those answers. So today, we're in Galatians chapter 3, and here's the crux. Here's the thesis of this. If we really want to become the people that God wants us to be, there's another component here. We've got to ask ourselves a question. And this question requires a little bit of honesty, okay, with ourselves. Here's the question. The question is, are we turning into a self-empowered Christian, or are we turning into a spirit-filled Christian? Are we turning into self-empowered people? I know our culture is. Our culture, it's all about being an individual and pull yourself up and be you and do what only you can do and obey yourself and all that. Are we turning into a self-empowered people of God to where uh, we are doing it all ourselves by works? If, and here's, a, here's an example of being self-empowered. Uh, I have got to get everything right in order to please God. Or, I have got to obey everything if God will love me. Or, I have got to do all these. It's a works-based theology. 
or feeling like we have to take it all on ourselves, and if we mess up, well, then God's going to be upset at you, and you better say the sinner's prayer again and turn around five times and light a candle and come to church three times, and, and that's just in two days, and, and just do all these different things in order for God to love you. Are we turning into self-empowered people to where it's on us, it's based on efforts and works, or are we turning into spirit-filled people where our decisions our lifestyles, our decision making, um, the, thing, our, the things that we decide to do, they're all a result of the Spirit of God working in us and through us. Our ability to overcome things, it's not because it's our ability, it's because the Spirit of God is working through us. Are we becoming self empowered or are we becoming spirit filled people? Because, friends, there's a huge difference between being self empowered and spirit filled. Um, so one of the things we need to do, though, is eliminate any condemnation right now from the start. It's uh, in here by saying this. It's oftentimes easier to do things yourself than it is to let somebody else do it. How many of you know that to be true? Sometimes it's just easier to do things yourself than it is to let somebody else do it. So we all struggle with this, being self-empowered. You know what? Just let me do it myself. It's easier for me just to handle it without letting or asking somebody for help to uh, help us. One of the challenges, um, I'm newly married. Uh, I got remarried to my beautiful wife, Tiffany, down here, and we're excited and we're doing great. A lot of you are asking how we're doing, and we're doing really good. You know, one of the, one of the learning curves that we're on, it's a big one, is the blended family. We have five kids now. Three of them were mine going to the marriage. Two of them were hers, and we're blending families. One of the big things that we're learning, if you're going into a blended family, I got a secret for you right now, because I'm learning this, and so is she is that we alone can't do all of the chores ourselves of seven people. There's no way. One person, whether it's Tiffany or whether it's me, we can't do all the vacuuming and all the laundry and all the dishes and all the cleaning of the, uh, uh, the, cleaning of the rooms and cooking meals and paying bills and running errands and taking five kids to different, three different schools. We're in three different schools taking five kids and um, fixing electronics, getting groceries, mopping, sweeping, helping all five kids with the homework, making the beds, feeding the cats. I mean, there's no way that one person... One person alone can do all of those things. Now, when it was just the three of them, it was no big deal for them. When it was just the four of me, it was no big deal. We could kind of work that out. But now that there's seven of us, there's no way. We got a partnership. We got to help out. And guess what? We are delegating to our kids saying, hey, you need to do all these things. Help, help out a little bit. But can you imagine, though, what our bathrooms look like right now? <laughs> I mean, we're, instead of cleaning the bathroom once every two weeks, it's like once a day right now. Once every two days, we're cleaning the bathrooms. When you take on the chores yourself, oftentimes it might seem easier because, you know, I can just do it myself and I'll, I'll get it all done. But in reality, that's not reality. It will, it will easily overwhelm you and overcome you and overtake you. There are people who live their entire Christian life trying to do all the right things to earn God's favor and trying to do all the right things to get into heaven. And that's not the Christian life. We've got to be spirit-filled. All the requirements and the rules of the Bible and the religion and their faith, it all becomes self-empowered. It's all by themselves. People um, who try to follow Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit oftentimes will get frustrated by their failures and overpowered and exhausted by their efforts. I'll say that again. People who try to follow Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit will oftentimes try to get, they will get frustrated by their failures. Oh, I messed up again. Or they will get exhausted by their efforts. You've got to have the Holy Spirit helping you and assisting you and giving you power. Amen? It's true. You've got to have the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're talking about today. Trying to be God in your life has a tendency to wear you out and leave you frustrated and tired. This is where we find Galatians chapter 3. Because what happens here is Paul just went into the church in Galatia, and he just taught a whole message about grace. And he taught a whole message about faith and spirit-filled living. And there were a group of uh, people that came right back in. These were false teachers. They came right back in. When Paul left the church, 
this group of people called the Judaizers, they were called the Judaizers, they came back into the church in Galatia and they started pushing the church back into works and pushing the church back toward the Old Testament law to do all these things. And Paul's like, I just taught you about grace and what it means to live by faith. And now these group of people are pushing you back into self-empowerment or pushing you back into the Old Testament law to where you have to do all of these things in order to get God to approve of you. And that's what these group of people were doing. And we pick it up in Galatians chapter 3. This is what Paul says. He finds out about this, and this is what he says to the church in Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. He says this. I'll read out of the New Living Translation this morning. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You receive the Spirit because you believe the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the what? Spirit. Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. Self-empowered faith. You might want to write this down, but self-empowered faith, it really focuses on human effort. It focuses on your human effort. A self-empowered faith is a faith that emphasizes the rules of the law. It emphasizes rules, guidelines. It's all about human effort. And it's all about works. That's the third thing you might want to write down. It's all about your works and your works alone. A self-empowered faith. Here's an example of this. Is if I were to hold, if all of us were to actually, you don't have to unless you need some exercise this morning. But if, if you were to hold your arms out in the air or hold them up like this for a while, you'd be like, you know what, I can do that. But, you know, if you were to do this for 30 minutes your arms might be getting what? Tired, right? And it's oftentimes we say, oh my goodness, my arms are getting heavy. It's not that our arms are actually getting any heavier than when we first started. It's that we're trying to do it all of ourselves. We're trying to hold them up by ourselves for a long period of time. And there's many Christians in the faith that try to do the faith and they try to live by the word and they try to live the Christian life all by themselves. They try to defeat uh, habits. They try to defeat uh, vices. They try to beat addictions all by themselves, and their arms are getting heavy. It's not that their arms are really getting heavy. It's that they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to fill them and to use them and to the power of the Holy Spirit to help them beat these things and to overcome. And they just keep their arms out, and they just keep their arms out. And pretty soon, I mean, I can do this right now already in my weak little arms. I'm already getting tired right now. But, you know, pretty soon, after a while, you're just exhausted, aren't you? You're just exhausted, and you're like, I can't even hold my arms up anymore. That's an example of self-empowered faith, is you trying to beat this, and you trying to do this, and it's all about you. And if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives and helping us defeat these things and helping us to overcome, and helping us to live our faith, then we are completely missing it. And that's exactly what Paul is telling the church in Galatia. He's saying, are you guys foolish? I just got done talking about this and you're going back into the works of the law. When you become a Christian, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you that in Scripture he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is up to us if we choose to operate in the Spirit of God, to let that gift work through us. It is up to us to let that gift work through us and to let the Holy Spirit use us and to change us from the inside out. Uh, an example of this is I have a little gift right here. This is a 20, well, hmm, I shouldn't say it. Hmm, I'm not going to say it. I want to give this gift to somebody in here. Um, I like this guy a lot, and I think, I'm not going to look at him right now, but he's going to start laughing at him the moment I'm going to say it. His birthday is on Wednesday, and he is, uh, I think he's turning 21 this Wednesday, but I'm going to give him this gift. His name is Jim Werdewatz over here. Happy birthday, Jim. <laughs> Your birthday is on Wednesday, right? <laughs> now, don't open the gift, Jim. Don't open it, but that's for you. Uh, don't open it because, you know, they might get out of the cage right there, but... 
I gave that gift to Jim right there. But it, he's not going to know what's in there unless he what? Opens the gift. Even if he opens the gift and he holds the little animal in his hand, he's not going to... It's not an animal. I'm just playing. But even if he holds the gift in his hand and it just stays there in his hand, what good is that gift going to do? He's got to... He, in order to operate, in order to really fully receive and to utilize the gift that I gave him, what is he going to have to do with that gift? Use it, right? He's going to have to... Do, in the same way, God gave us the holy... Happy birthday, by the way, Jim, coming up. God gave us the Holy Spirit. But in order for the Holy Spirit to activate in our lives, we've got to receive the Holy Spirit and let Him take over. Let the Holy Spirit take over. Let the Holy Spirit direct you in your decisions. Let the Holy Spirit help you be defeat and overcome things. Let the Holy Spirit teach you how to live. We've got to do it. If we don't do that, if we just say, well, God, thank you for the Holy Spirit, and we don't let Him take over our lives, it's as if... He gave us a gift, and we're not even using it. Kind of like me giving the gift to Jim there, and it just sits in his hands for the next year. Uh, there would be no point. There would be no use. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives and to fill us. And let's look at that. Let's look at the filling of the Holy Spirit. I want to show you John chapter 16. This is pretty, pretty cool here. Turn with me to John chapter 16. <clears throat> John chapter 16. Let's go to 14, actually. John chapter 14, and then we'll go to 16 here. I don't want to live a Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't want to try to live your faith without operating in the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit take control of your lives and your mind. And we can do that. It's us taking control letting go of the wheel and letting the Holy Spirit lead us. The filling of the Holy Spirit. This is a big theological uh, concept here that I want to show you. John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. And then we're going to look at John chapter 16. So John chapter 14, 15 through 17. Jesus is talking here and he says this. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. That's the Holy Spirit. He says it right there. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Later will be in you. So I want to emphasize that. He lives with you now, but later he will be what, church? In you. Okay, that's big. Let's go to John chapter 16, verse number 5 through 7. The main idea with that, John 14, is that Jesus tells his disciples, later on, the Holy Spirit will not only be with you, he will be in you, living among them. John 16, verse 5 through 7. This is a really interesting passage. But Jesus is talking. But now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the Advocate, or the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and the coming judgment. This is a really big statement here that Jesus says. He says right here, he says, It is better for you that I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. And can you imagine hearing that from Jesus? Jesus is saying, it's better that I leave right now. It's better that I go. Because when I go, the Holy Spirit is going to come. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. If I do go, the Holy Spirit will come to you. When you study the theological differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, it's quite fascinating. One distinction in the Old Testament and the New Testament, this is a really big one. I highly recommend, unless you've got a really good memory, to write this down. But... This is a really big distinct, distinction. Theologically, in the Old Testament, God was with his people. The emphasis was God was with his people. The Bible says that God was with Abraham. God was with Moses. God was with Joseph. God was with Elisha. All those Old Testament characters. In the New Testament, not only is it God with his people, it's God in his people. 
So the Old Testament, it's God with his people. In the New Testament, it's not just God with his people. It's God in his people through the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wished that you could just, you could have been in the old days? I don't know. I have. I've wished that, man, if I was just there with David, seeing him take down Goliath, I wish, I wish I was, I was there with the parting of the Red Sea. Wouldn't you want to be there? Maybe. Uh, how about just interacting with Jesus? I mean, why did he choose those 12? Why couldn't he create me back then and just walk with Jesus? Have you ever wished that? I, just think about Moses. I mean, imagine that we had a conversation with Moses and we had the opportunity. Moses, what was it like to see the parting of the Red Sea? What was it like to go to the burning bush and to witness that right there? Moses, what was it like to follow the cloud by day and the fire by night? And Moses might say to us, well, that's great. I mean, it was pretty cool, but God was with us. He might even ask us the question, turn it around. Yeah, Jeff, but what is it like to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and helping you make decisions and giving you peace? Jeff, what what is it like to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Because that wasn't available to me back in the Old Testament, you know, burning bush days. But now in the New Testament, in this day, it's available to you. What was it like to have the Holy Spirit, to God in you instead of just with you? That's a big distinction that we ought to make as Christians and that the Bible makes theologically is God was with the Old Testament. Jesus was with his disciples. But today, God offers the Holy Spirit to us to where he can be in us, operating and acting through us. Jesus says in John 16, it's better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come and be with you. God with you is a good thing, Jesus says, but God in you is even better. Jesus could be with his followers, but the Holy Spirit can be in his followers today. Romans chapter 8, verse number 11 says, The same Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, friend, lives in you. I'll say it again. The same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. It lives in me. It's the same Spirit. The Spirit of power. A Spirit of overcoming. A Spirit of victory. Not a Spirit of defeat. Not a Spirit of depression. Not a Spirit of despair. But it's a Spirit of victory. The Holy Spirit. The same Spirit lives in you that raised Jesus from the dead. You may ask, how do I know if the Holy Spirit is living inside of me? There's several indicators. One of them, here's the one I want to point out. Okay, I want to be very clear here. This is one of many, okay? This is one of many. But one of them is you've got to be honest with yourself and with God and with others about your weaknesses. And then you've got to turn them over to the Holy Spirit. You've got to be honest that you have weaknesses and that you are weak and that I am weak. And then we turn it over to the Holy Spirit because in our weaknesses, He is strong. We've got to understand that, that weakness, and here's one of the paradoxes in all of the Bible, and there's several paradoxes. Here's one, is that in our weakness, we're actually stronger. In our weak, if you're weak, you actually have the opportunity to be even stronger than what you were before. The truth is, most of us, though, go through great lengths to disguise our weaknesses, don't we? The most of us go through great lengths to disguise our weaknesses. Uh, I love to cook tri-tip. I love to cook. I love to barbecue. I love to barbecue hamburgers. Most of you know that. I love to barbecue chicken. I might be doing that later on today. Some of you might come on over. All right? One of the things that I simply cannot barbecue, I mean, I stink at it. I cannot barbecue ribs. Ribs are very hard for me to barbecue. I either under barbecue them or I overcook them and it's like beef jerky. It's not good. If you were to say, hey, Jeff, let's have a barbecue, and why don't you come, or why don't, why don't I come over, and we'll come over, and we'll barbecue. The first thing I will say is, yeah, I can cook some tri-tip. Let's barbecue. <laughs> well, and if you say, well, hey, well, how about we have some ribs? I'll say, well, yeah, we can, but I really cook good tri-tip, because I'm, I'm not wanting you to know, and I just shared with you, but I'm not wanting you to know that I don't really cook ribs very well, but I can cook barbecue. Most of us go through really great lengths to disguise our weaknesses. One of the most dreaded questions ever is in a job interview. And in a job interview, do you know what one of the most dreaded questions that nobody wants to hear their boss ask? Do you know what it is? What would you say are your weaknesses? What's funny about that 
is in job interviews. Have you ever been like a, if you're, somebody's applying for an administration job and then they're asked, what would you say are your, your greatest weaknesses? They give you like a, an answer like, uh, well, you know, I'm not a very good cook. Or I drive too fast. And what they share, their weaknesses, has nothing to do with the job that they're applying for. You've been there. Don't act like you haven't. We've all been there, right? You say something, we're like, you know, I really don't want you to know this. Or if it's a customer service job. Nobody, nobody ever says if they're applying for a customer service job. Nobody ever says, you know what, I really, I'm not good with people at all. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm applying for your job. <laughs> but I really, I don't like them. Nobody ever says that, right? <laughs> or uh, how about a manual labor job when you got to get up at 5 a.m. and you're, you know you're going to be sweating all day and it's just hard work, it's hard elbow grease. Nobody applying for a labor job that has to be there at 5 a.m., they don't say when they're asking or talking about their weaknesses, they don't say, you know what, <laughs> I'm actually a couch potato. I'm really lazy. One of my weaknesses is I don't get up before 11.45 a.m. every day. They don't say that. What do they say? They say things like, I'm not a really good cook or something like that. And so it's, it's easy for us to disguise our weaknesses. The truth is most of us go through great lengths to disguise our weaknesses. But this is one of many paradoxes that when we are weak, we are actually strong in the Lord. Let's look at 2 Corinthians. I want to show you this. Paul does something fascinating here. He does something that is a great example to you and me today and to the entire church. I mean, this is, we're talking about the Apostle Paul here. This man theologically is on it. He is extremely intellectual. He is extremely brilliant. And God is clearly using him. He's going around and people are being healed and he's writing tons of books and he's equipping pastors and he's training them. Paul does something here. He exposes to the entire world his weaknesses. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 6. Let's start there. He says this. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said to me, my grace is all you need or my grace is sufficient for you. And here's the key line right here. My power, God says, works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take great pleasures in weaknesses and in the insults and hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am what, church? Strong. God says my power works best in your weaknesses. My power works best in your weaknesses. The power of the Spirit of God operating in your life is directly linked to your ability to acknowledge your weaknesses. Because it's in our weaknesses that the power of God can work. I'll say that again. The power of God through the Holy Spirit operating in your life, it's directly linked to your acknowledgement of your weaknesses. We've got to say, Lord, I am weak in this area and I need the Spirit of God to take over and lead and to help me. And that's when God says, according to this verse, God says, my power works best at that very moment. Another way to put it is this way. And this is kind of uh, heavy, okay? So it's a little bit heavy. I'm just forewarning you. It's a little bit heavy, but you can handle it. Here we go. Here it is. The prouder you are, the harder it is for the Holy Spirit to operate and to lead you in your life. The prouder you are, the prouder you are, nothing's wrong with me, I'm good, I don't need any help. You and I and God both know that that's not the case. The prouder we are, the harder it is the Holy Spirit, and the harder it is for the Holy Spirit to operate in and through us. The more we want people to think that we have it all together, the more that we think we want to fix it ourselves, and that we don't need really anybody's help and we really don't need God's help and this is something that I have to do and I have to do alone and I really don't need any help. That is pride and that is what the Holy Spirit doesn't work well in. He doesn't operate in that very well. But when we acknowledge our weakness and we call upon God and we say, God, I need your help in this week. 
weakness. I need your Holy Spirit to take over right now because I really plan on doing this in about 10 minutes and I need you, Spirit of God, to take over in my life. Do you know when we pray that, God says, thank you for acknowledging that you're weak and my power is going to work in you and take over. And that's what he does. And so in our weakness, God is made and the Holy Spirit is made powerful Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of the sin and of God's righteousness. And that leads to repentance because it acknowledges our weakness. In Galatians chapter 5, let's go there. Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. Somebody's here today and you're listening to this message and if you're wondering why you're in a rut and you're wondering why you can't defeat this in your life and you're wondering why you can't overcome and you're wondering all these things, the question that I have for you is the question that we started with, are you turning into a self-empowered Christian or are you allowing the Spirit of God to fill your life and to change you from the inside out? Because that's what God wants for all of us is the Holy Spirit to operate through us. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 to 26 says this 24 to 26 Galatians chapter 5 24 to 26 those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross and have crucified them there this is key since we are living by the spirit let us follow the spirit's leading in every part of our lives let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Let the Spirit of God do the leading in your life. Think about that. In the New Living Translation, it says, let the Spirit of God do this in every part of your life. Not just in three out of the 17 parts. In every part, let the Spirit of God lead you and fill you. Let Him convict you. Let Him change you from the inside. Let the Holy Spirit help you make the decisions. Fill your conscience. Fill your mind. Fill your heart. Let the Holy Spirit fill you and lead you. Instead of making decisions on your own and just doing all these things on your own, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and to lead you. And before I make this decision, I'm going to buy this or I'm going to move here or I'm going to talk to this person or I'm going to apply for this or I'm going to quit this. Any decision like that, before you do any of that, let the Holy Spirit lead you and say, Holy Spirit, take over my mind, take over my thoughts, take over my heart, fill my life before I make any decision. And you know what? That's letting the Holy Spirit lead you. That's how we ought to live our lives. That is how we ought to live our lives. It's not in our power. It's letting the Holy Spirit take over us and then we go from there. And that's good news. And that's what God wants us to do. If we want to become the people that God wants us to be, We've got to be a people who are spirit-led. We've got to be people who are spirit-filled and spirit-led. We cannot be self-empowered. I've got it all together. We can't do that. We can't do that at all. Let's look at the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4. Anybody getting anything? Are you getting some stuff here? Okay. It's kind of quiet in here. Talk to me. I don't want to live in a bubble here. We're, 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 we're tracking together, right? Okay. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Oh, man, this is good. This is really good. Here we go. Luke chapter 4. Watch what Jesus does. This right here is going to be for somebody today. God led you here to listen to this right here. This is powerful. Luke chapter 4, verse number 1. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and then he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. And Jesus ate nothing all the time and he became very hungry. Now for the following verses, all, I'm not going to read through all of that. You know, the devil is tempting him. He's hungry. He's fasting. The spirit led him into the desert. He's praying. Obviously he's spending time with God, but he's in a low place. He's in the desert. He's in a dry, dry place in his life. And the enemy picks up on that. He captures Jesus alone he captures Jesus alone and he starts tempting him. But he makes it through that because he is again full of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why Jesus got through that desert time? Because in verse 1 it says that he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was led by the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Look at verse number 14. Look at how Jesus is now in verse 14. Look at 13. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee... Filled with the Holy Spirit's what? Power. 
He was full of the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a filling of the Holy Spirit. I might do a sermon series on this pretty soon. There's the filling of the Holy Spirit. There's the leading of the Holy Spirit. But there's also the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus went into the desert filled with the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. But when he came out of that desert place, he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he began to make decisions, and he didn't start his ministry until that took place. He was filled, he was led, and then he went out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think in the Christian life, and just talking with people that struggle, and I struggle, I mean, we're all in this boat, we're all in this camp. But, you know, God, he sends his Holy Spirit to us. And it's similar to, like, holding a present. We're just not operating in the Spirit of God. We're not asking the Spirit of God to fill us. We're not asking the Spirit of God to lead us. And because of that, we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit living through us. But how many of you know, when you ask the Spirit of God to lead you, to fill you, when you get on your knees and you turn off that TV, or you put your cell phone away, and you got a decision to make, or there's an issue in your life that you're struggling, or there's a relationship in your life that you're just, you're at odds with them right now. How many of you know when you put everything away and you get on your knees for a half hour or 15 minutes or an hour and pray for those people and plead for those people and ask God to change you and to show you what offense you have done and then you pray for them. How many of you know that when you're in that place for 30 minutes or even an hour, when you get up off of your knees and you're sitting there asking him to fill you, to lead you and to show you, Holy Spirit, just fill me right now and show me what I'm doing wrong and what offensive thing I I have done show me where I need to correct my actions when we get up off of our knees in that half hour we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit how many of you know that and the same situation that you just talked about and complained about one hour ago is completely different it's a totally different perspective when you pray and when you get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and out of that is when we ought to make decisions hello out of that is when we decide certain things. Out of that is when we choose, should we fly there or should we not? Out of that is where we choose, should I talk to this person or should I cut it off? It's out of that time, being with the Spirit of God, that we can make the accurate decisions, we can be become the people that God wants us to be, which is people who are Spirit-filled, Spirit-led, and with the power of the Holy Spirit as well. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and I think this is the only time, we're out of time, but, um, man, why do I keep doing that? I, I put, I, yeah, Acts 1, I got to work on it. I'm in process too. <laughs> Acts 1, too much, Jeff, too much. Acts 1, verse number 8. Disciples are hanging out. Jesus comes back. He's resurrected from the grave. He's making appearances to his disciples. And here he, what he says in John 16 is about saying, it's better that I go so the Holy Spirit can come. It's happening right here. Here's the moment. He's ascending into heaven. This is the ascension of Jesus. And the last thing that Jesus says to his disciples, it's in Acts 1. It's powerful. You will receive what, church? Power. When who comes upon them? The Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Can you imagine the disciples standing there? Can you imagine yourself standing there? And you're like, oh, great. Jesus is leaving. I mean, the guy who did all the miracles, the guy that we've seen cast out demons, the guy who just rose from the dream, he's leaving us again. Wait, great. What are we going to do now? Can you imagine watching him ascend to the heaven? There he goes. And feeling a sense of, man, what, what, what are we supposed to do now? Jesus says, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses when you're filled, obviously, with the Spirit of God. You will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And friends, I want to say that to you. I'm not Jesus, trust me, but I'm sharing what Jesus said. And he said this, you will receive power in your life when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be able to do witnesses. You'll be able to do things. Jesus said, greater things will you do. You will be able to overcome. You will be able to defeat. You will be able to live, make decisions. You will be able to do all kinds of things when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But God gives you the Holy Spirit. The question is, do you want to be filled and live with the Holy Spirit? Or do you want to be self-empowered to where, you know what? I got it handled. It's okay. I, I can handle my life. <laughs> I've tried to say that. I've said that to God. God, you know what? Just leave me alone. I'm good. I can handle my life. There are millions of people today that are saying, you know what, God? Leave me alone. I, I really, they're saying it by their lifestyle. I don't really need you. I can handle life on my own. And God's like, I have a gift for you. It's the Holy Spirit. You will receive power in your life, but you got to receive it. There was a pastor. I close with this. There's a pastor who put on uh, Facebook. He, he put this phrase, and then he let all his friends respond. He put this phrase, and the phrase was, by the, Holy, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he just said, fill in the blank. And all of his friends responded. Some of them did. And here's what they responded so by the power of the Holy Spirit, and within, here's his testimony, within 24 hours, I had over 100 responses from my friends on Facebook. And this is what their answers were. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I finally forgave my dad. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I lost 150 pounds and I quit smoking. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I have forgiven my ex-husband for his infidelity. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we have adopted two boys from Ethiopia. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I overcame drug addiction. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I overcame a gambling addiction. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I overcame a sex addiction. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I overcame a shopping addiction. One person said this, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I overcame an eating disorder. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I am four years sober. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I am able to raise my special needs child, even as a single mom working full time. By the power of the Holy Spirit, my marriage was saved. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we conceived after being told it would never happen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, my child returned home after three years of utter silence. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I found peace when my husband passed away and I thought my life was over. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, he helped me. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I remarried my ex-husband after a long, nasty divorce. Story after story from followers who are filled with the Holy Spirit responded to this. Now, I'd like us to do one thing. I'd like you to put your testimony in there. What are you struggling with? What is that thing that you need to overcome? What is that thing that is defeating you? By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do things that in your weakness, that's God's power. You are made strong by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a free gift to all of us. God said, Jesus said, I have to go, but I have to go. And since I'm going, I give you the Holy Spirit. So our prayer this morning, and the whole point of the message here this morning, is that if we want to become the people that God wants us to become, if we want to transform into those people, the Spirit-led people, we've got to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us and to lead us to operate through us. Fill us to lead us and to operate through us. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, we'll have the team come up here and is the Holy Spirit leading you, friend? Is the Holy Spirit filling you? Is the Holy Spirit operating through you? If the answer is, I'm not sure, then what you can do is ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life today. If the answer is no, if you're a Christian, and the answer is no, I ha you know, I haven't been, the Holy Spirit hasn't been operating through me lately, or this week, or this month, or the last three years. If the answer is no, then today's your day to ask the Holy Spirit to come fill you again. Remove, remove you from you. Remove your hands off the wheel in your life and let the Holy Spirit take over. Let the Holy Spirit give you power. Ah, yes. Father, we ask in Jesus' name. First of all, before we ask, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to us. 
giving us a gift, yourself, God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, living in us. We thank you, Lord, that you're no longer just with us. You are in us, and you want to be in us. I pray for the people today. I pray for all of us, including myself in this number, that we will be led by the Spirit of God before we even open our mouths again. We pray that you will, you will fill us and that you will lead us. We pray, Lord, that you will empty us of us and that the people who are here today listening to this message and getting the word of God in them, Lord, the Holy Spirit will fill them this week and they will have a different week this week than they did last week. They will make decisions differently today than they did even yesterday. They will treat people differently because the Holy Spirit is living in them and operating through them than they did last week or last month. I pray, God, that you would lead us and fill us and operate in and through us. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in this place and in our lives. Let's, uh, let's all stand together and let's respond with that song. Let's, let's play that song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. The altars are open. If you'd like to come and kneel or just stand, nobody's going to come pray with you. If it's, just, it's between you and God. Nobody will come pray with you today. If you want to come to the altars, you can, or just kneel, whatever you have to do, asking the Holy Spirit to fill you before we move on with our lives. Amen.